So I wanted to mainly talk about perennials. So the last couple of videos that we've done have been focusing on fruit trees, small fruits for the garden. We've looked at sowing seeds. We've also looked at warm season versus cool season vegetables. So I wanted to kind of hit on perennials. Now this is not an all intensive list of everything that does great in Tennessee. These are just some of the ones that I've seen that do really well. And I'm sure you have some perennials that you really like as we go through this. So feel free to, to add some of those as we get at the end. So at the very end, we're gonna kind of open this up for discussion. And if you've got certain perennials that you really like, I wanna know those also, especially if you've got cultivar names. So when we say coral bells, that's the family heuchera. There are hundreds of different heucheras or coral bells right now. I'd love to know specific names of the ones that are doing really well. As we kind of dive into this, we need to research on what these plants actually need before we plant them in our garden. Now, when we see this picture right here, this is hosta. We know hosta is not a full sun plant. I took this picture at a hotel recently. I think this was in Kentucky somewhere, and they had a lot of hostas around their pool in full sun, and they had them around their parking lots next to the hot concrete. And I thought, what landscaper puts hostas in full sun? If we kind of start off by putting the plant in the right spot, we, we won't actually kind of get it sick, and then once it gets sick, it's going to become uh, diseased. It can get some of these fungi, these bacteria that are actually flying through the air. So if we kind of start off with a healthy plant and we keep it healthy, we don't stress it out, that'll help out in the long run. Also research the height and also research the size. So a lot of the, and I'm going to use hosta again for an example, some hostas are considered miniature and they only get six or eight inches wide. Some hostas are giant and they can get four or five feet wide. So we need to actually be sure that we're placing the right plant in the right spot. So I'm gonna show you some perennials that get really large and some that stay small. So I tried to, to divvy it up to the beginning perennials are all mostly perennials that are geared towards sun. And then the back half are mostly perennials that are ge geared towards shade. So hopefully uh, if you've got sun or shade, you're able to kind of work with both lists. Luckily, I've got a, a shade garden this year. I put a bunch of different hostas in um, and some pulmonarias and things. I'll show you some pictures of those in just a few minutes. But research the plant, not, and I, and I can't harp on this enough. If we just say hosta, there's hundreds and thousands of different hostas. Some stay small, some stay big. Research, research, research the size of the plant. Yeah, and we all know plants read their tags so they know exactly how big they should actually get. As we're jumping into this, I kind of want to talk about other plants that were not full sun plants that were in full sun situations. This is that coral bells. I love coral bells, which is heuchera. This one was one uh, that's a, it's a, a yellow type. The heucheras do not like full sun. Here they were at a Walmart parking lot in full sun surrounded by concrete. So not an ideal plant for this situation. This is when we stress out plants and then they get diseased and we wonder why they catch some of these diseases that are coming down the pipeline. We've stressed them out, putting them in situations where they're not getting enough water, they're not getting the right sun shade requirements. One other plant that I, I took a picture of just a few weeks ago in Lebanon, Tennessee, when we talk about finding the right plant for the right spot. Now, some plants have an in invasive tendency. This is horsetail equisetum. This plant is invasive. It really should only be grown in a concrete pot without any holes whatsoever, because once it actually gets into the ground, it takes over. So I assume the landscaper did not realize its invasive tendencies and planted just a few in there, because you can see there's some some monkey grass interplanted in there too, which really doesn't make any any hill of beans anymore because it's the equisetum or the horsetail is going to take over the entire thing. So I wanted to show you research some of these plants that may have an invasive tendency. There are some situations where we've seen some variegated plants for sale. I remember seeing a nursery a few years ago selling a variegated kudzu called Sherman's Revenge. Luckily, I did not buy it. But I don't know if you're a really hardcore gardener, maybe you wanted a variegated kudzu in your garden. <laughs> kind of jumping in these perennials, I don't have a plant list, so I wanted, I'll kind of reiterate the names as we go through this. This is one of the best perennials that's kind of been promoted the last couple of years. It actually won perennial plant of the year. This is Amsonia. That's A-M-S-O-N-I-A. -S it's Amsonia hubrichtii. It has such soft, feathery foliage, it kind of blows through the wind. 
But what really looks great about this plant in the fall time, it turns a really bright yellow. But this is one of those perennials that kind of needs space. It needs to be able to run, you know, four or five feet because it kind of gets this big open habit to it. But it does die back to the ground. But it it really does kind of add a nice soft feathery feature to the landscape, but give it plenty of room. Jumping into these, like I said a minute ago, all these first plants that I'm talking about are full sun plants, and toward the end, we're going to go through a few shade plants. I don't have a, a, a huge list of things. These were just some things that I've seen that do really well in Tennessee. This is Aster, a great one called October Skies, and we kind of lack in the perennial garden in Tennessee of things blooming in the fall time. You can kind of see on the left side of that screen. That's Solidago or Goldenrod. And in the middle, of that's that October Skies Aster. Now they changed the Latin name of Aster a couple of years ago. It's no longer Aster. It's something that rolls off the tongue a lot easier called Symphiotrichum. And you can look that up to make sure I'm even pronouncing that right. I saw that here recently and I thought, why would they change the name Aster to something that I can't even pronounce? What I like about this plant is it makes, it makes huge perennial pillows in the landscape that blooms in the fall time. We're always concerned about our pollinators. So one of the things that we can do to help them out in the fall time is give them things that bloom in the fall time because we see a big push on spring blooms and summer bloom. We don't necessarily have a lot of these perennials that are blooming full heavily in the fall time. This October sky is up. This was some pictures from Riverdale High School a few years ago. We put quite a few in some of the beds. I do love this plant. The only problem with this plant, it can become a little bit of a thug in the garden. It has some invasive tendencies. This was also another picture from Riverdale. This is black and blue salvia. This is in the salvia family. It's called salvia garanitica. And it can get anywhere from four to five feet tall. It has a black and blue flower. And what's cool about it, this is a great plant to attract hummingbirds to the garden. So we're always looking for plants to attract hummingbirds. They like that tubular shaped bloom. Black and blue salvia is one of those things, but it can be vigorous in the garden. And sometimes it'll spread pretty quickly and actually run outside of the area than what you're actually wanting it to be. So if you plant one, kind of be having the back of your head that this thing's going to run just a little bit. But once it kind of gets set, I really like it. And this was also another picture from Riverdale a few years ago. Most of you probably won't even guess what this is. And I used to really love using this plant around my landscape beds around my house. And that's, I took this picture on January the 1st. This was lemon thyme. Lemon thyme, it is an herb, has little bitty flowers off and on in the summertime. Gets just four or five inches tall, but it basically makes a nice carpet. So I had it running around some of my rock edgings in my beds because it kind of prefers it a little bit drier, but I took this picture on January the 1st because it pretty much is evergreen most of the winter time. And I saw another one at the Wilson County Fairgrounds just a month or two ago, and it pretty much looks the same way. It kind of makes a tight little uh, ball, and it kind of would resemble sedum. So that when people see this, they automatically think some type of a succulent, but it's just lemon thyme. I love lemon thyme, and if you're not growing some lemon thyme, you need to find some, grow some seeds, get some cuttings from your friends because it's pretty easy to root also. This is sedum rupestre, one called Angelina. Now, Angelina sedum is a great ground cover sedum. I've got another one that I've got here at the house called Lemon Ball, which is a bright yellow. Angelina sedum is pretty much an evergreen sedum in Tennessee, but it will change color. So in the, in the wintertime, it kind of goes to a coppery orange. In the springtime, it becomes a bright yellow. And in the summertime, it kind of goes to a yellowish green. So it actually changes colors all throughout the year. And it does have little flowers in the springtime. But what I love about it is it forms a great thick carpet. So if you've got some area in your landscape beds that's really dry, you're not able to really grow anything, could be rocky in certain beds. Some of these succulents, like this sedum angelina, this is a great plant. So if you're wanting to actually move this around in the garden, just take a clump of it go somewhere and then halfway bury it in the ground wherever it's going to be and it'll it'll usually root pretty fast because sedum has the ability to root really quickly. I never thought I would see the day that I would promote a monkey grass. This is liriope. Now this is not the old green liriope that once you plant it you regret it three or four years later because it's taken over all of your beds. 
This liriope is a clumping liriope. It's called PD Gold Ingot, and I just planted a new one at my new house uh, this week. It is a bright yellow monkey grass with purple flowers, but it does not run like the other one, so I wanted to stress that tendency real fast. <laughs> But this one looks good pretty much in full sun. It looks good in half-day sun, half-day shade. The picture on the right is actually in full sun. The more sun it gets, the brighter it actually looks. It can kind of look like a highlighter in the landscape. So I love looking at some of these yellow plants because in the landscape, your eyes are automatically drawn to them. This is a great native plant that, that you can pretty much grow on a rock. This is Northwind switchgrass. Now, northwind switchgrass is in the panicum family. It is a switchgrass. It basically gets four to five feet tall and it kind of stands up like a column. So, if you were trying to guide someone on a walkway or maybe put some this is emphasis on where the walkways were, and we had some going to a fountain here at Riverdale, it was great because it did not run and get out of control. Now, the easiest way will it does go down dormant in the wintertime. We would just go through and have kids cut it at the ground and then take the uh, the uh, the old the old leaves and kind of compost them or get rid of them off the property somewhere. But I love it because it doesn't really flop open. The only problem with this, it would flop open if you heavily fertilize it. They really thrive on neglect. So I'm trying to focus on some of these plants that really like to be left alone. Sometimes in our gardens, we over fertilize things. We overwater things. I think we see more plants die from overwater, over fertilization, over love. Basically, stop loving these plants too much. A lot of these plants have done fine for many, many years. <laughs> Just leave them alone. This is one of those, don't really do anything to it. This was also perennial plant of the year. I think this one was two years ago. This is Allium Millennium, and it's an ornamental flowering onion, and it stays kind of shorter, like 12 to 14 inches tall, but it is a beautiful little flowering onion. But I wanted to highlight another perennial plant of the year, and that's what Millennium Onion is, Millennium Allium is. Now, some cannas are hardier than others. I think one of the hardiest cannas is this one right here called Bengal Tiger. Now, Bengal Tiger, this was taken in the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina at my favorite daylily operation. It has kind of a bright yellow foliage, orange flowers, and this stuff is tough as nails, and it will kind of run gangbusters a little bit, because this was where this picture was taken. This was zone six, so we kind of had the tendency to think in the back of our head that we need to dig up all the cannas. Now, some cannas are less hardier than others. This one right here seems to do really well, so if you're trying to look for something to add a tropical effect around your house, this Bengal tiger canna would actually do a great job of that. That's my mother-in-law, and if you know anything about me, I think the greatest perennial in the world is daylilies. <laughs> some of them stay really short. We have some that are like 12, 14 inches tall, and then we have some like the one on the left that can get six to seven feet tall. I believe the one on the left was actually called Notify Ground Crew, and the one on the right was called Toy Trumpets. So we see a lot of, excuse me, daylilies that are promoted. Stella Diaro. Happy returns, pardon me. They are all great landscape plants. They all rebloom. They're tough as nails, but I don't think we realize that daylilies really come in a wide array of colors. Most of them really thrive on neglect, but they do, you know, help out a little bit if you've got some fertilizer, some compost you want to use on them. I, I probably do not fertilize my daylilies enough at my house, but I want to also stress these things really need full sun to, to bloom well. A lot of these full sun plants, if they, they'll grow in partial sun, partial shade, but to really get the full effect of all their blooms, they need full sun. And daylilies are one of those, they need full sun. Just to kind of highlight some other colors, this is a daylily farm in North Carolina that I love visiting every year. And I wanted to show you, daylilies now come in tens of thousands of different hybrids available. Maybe you heard that, right? Tens of thousands. And if you're just now beginning to garden, I think every full sun garden at least needs one daylily in it because you're going to get a lot of great blooms in the summertime. But just to kind of highlight, they come in all sorts of shapes and colors. You can find them in every color except for a true white and a true blue. 
And if anybody ever develops a true blue daylily, you could probably retire <laughs> with the money that you would make off of it. Here's some other ones that I love. And some of these are, are seedlings that are basically being trialed before they come out. They come in doubles. They come in spider type forms. You can find them in basically every shape and size. Now, iris are also the same way. We have a lot of great iris people in our state because iris is the flower of Tennessee. Kind of highlighting this is a, a, it has a rhizome. They're easy to get. So we see this as kind of an heirloom type plant. I see it in uh, old homesteads where maybe the homes are kind of collapsing or old barns or old mailboxes. And I see these still surviving and still blooming every year. They come in a lot of different colors also right now, just kind of highlighting some of these. And the one on the right is actually a, a Louisiana iris. That one was called Kentucky Thoroughbred, but I love the colors in it. A couple other iris, the one on the left. The one on the right is actually our native species iris. This is the one that we may see next to creeks in shady type areas. We may have seen it in the Smokies. This is Iris cristata, and it only gets about four or five inches tall. I had to lay on the ground to get this picture, but I, I love that little native iris, and it does kind of prefer a little bit more shade. But I've seen it growing in some sun also. Now, daffodils are also one of those plants that I think are tough as nails, and if you can't grow daffodils, you probably shouldn't even begin to garden. <laughs> Go find another hobby. This is one of those plants. Look at this old house where it was a barn. It looks great, and the daffodils are still blooming. And we've got some great societies, like the last three plants that I mentioned. There's some great daylily societies. There's some great iris societies. There's great daffodil societies around. So wherever you're at, I'm sure you can kind of link to some of these. And a lot of these people are really giving with a lot of their plants because they want people to experience the joys of some of these perennials. I believe this one was called apricot whirl or apricot swirl. I can't remember, but it was just a beautiful double daffodil I had a few years ago in a garden. Now, peonies is how you say it from the south. Now, Martha Stewart says peony. So it depends on who you are on how you're going to say it. I've heard it everything called pine rose, pineys, piney roses. Peony is how I grew up saying it. And then I learned later it's peonia, which is the Latin name for it. And this is another one of those heirloom type perennials that really does well. And what's great about some of these newer peonies that are coming out, we have tree form and then we have herbaceous. So they actually crossed them and they're called intersectional hybrids. We call them ito, I-T-O-H. And we're seeing some of these tree type forms are kind of a shrubby type peony type form. And you'll see a lot of the bright colors in yellows and oranges and pinks and whites. And some of the newer ones you'll see on the market, I think there's some great ones called Copper Kettle. We see one called Lemon Dream. Bartzella is probably the most popular one out right now, which is an Ito type peony. For another good full sun type plant, Echinacea. And if you're in Tennessee, you need to be growing some form of Echinacea. I got so excited. It was probably 20 years ago when I saw the first orange cone flower come out. And these are my beds at my mother's house that I planted when I was probably 16 or 18 years old. I saw it at a garden center. I saw an orange colored cone flower called Orange Meadow Bright and also went by the name Arts Pride. It was a cross of Echinacea purpurea and one called Echinacea paradoxa. So they crossed them and they developed this whole array of different colors. So cone flowers come in purple, white, yellow, orange, purple, pink. Uh, there's some green hueish ones now. I hopefully I got all the colors, but what's great about them is when you plant one, they reseed. So I wanted to highlight, I planted the orange one and the other one's basically filled in. I think the white one in that picture was white swan. Powwow wildberry is a great seed grown cone flower, and you talk about heavily florific. One of my favorite ones are this new series called uh, Cheyenne Spirit. Now, Cheyenne Spirit is a seed-grown variety of coneflower, and it can come in red, white, pink, purple, orange, raspberry. So it comes in all sorts of colors. So if you buy Cheyenne Spirit from a website, you could get any of those colors. If you want to buy it and you want to make sure it's the right color, go to the you know, garden center and actually buy that one that's actually blooming that day. So Cheyenne Spirit, you buy 10 different one, ones, you could theoretically get seven or eight different colors in that mix. 
I got one or two more sun plants. This is Rudbeckia, which is Black Eyed Susans, and this is a, a tough as nails plant also. This was one of my favorite ones that my mother still has at the house called Henry Eilers. Now, Henry Eilers has quilled petals, and they're all, there also is a dwarf form of it called Little Henry. Now, Henry Eilers, the only fault with that is it gets too big sometimes. The wind starts rocking it, and it'll fall and kind of lay over on something, but luckily there's some hydrangeas. That giant reed grass was also next to it, so it was able to lean on it some. So that's the only fault with Henry Eilers. It gets so tall, it can lean over and fall down. My last full sun plant, if you've got just straight gravel at your house, I took this picture in a garden in Kentucky, and you've got full sun areas, just make it a succulent type garden. Now, Semper Vivums, hens and chicks, they do well if they are not watered pretty much at all. And we have them out in Tennessee. The only issue sometimes they may die in the winter time with the amount of rain we're getting right now. So you may have to actually amend your soil. You can amend it with small gravel or some kind of a, a mixture that you can buy of just, just mostly the small pebble rocks and grow them in it. The only problem with they would probably die in the winter time if they're just grown in straight soil. Now I had some in pots that I left outside all winter. Some of them died, some of them lived. Kind of, this is a half sun, half shade plant. Now, spiderwort sometimes can be rambunctious in the garden, and sometimes we regret planting them. I do love this sweet kate one. Sweet kate is a yellow form with kind of that purplish flower, so whenever it blooms, it really contrasts nicely. The flowers do close up whenever it gets really hot on it, but it has yellow foliage, and I love these yellow foliage plants, and I think where I was growing these in the uh, previous house, they were morning sun, afternoon shade. Kind of moving into some, uh, this one is some shade plants. This is Spigelia marilandica. This is called Indian pinks, and this is a great native plant. And we don't see it as much anymore, but luckily we're starting to see it for sale in nurseries. I like it because the bloom looks like a little firecracker exploding, and they kind of form like a carpet, and they'll get anywhere from 16, 17 inches tall, but they'll be covered in the summertime with all these little bitty exploding firework type flowers. And this is one of the native plants. This plant has a terrible name, but it also won perennial of the year. I believe it did, called Hakanakloa. It kind of sounds like a, a symptom of the flu right now, Hakanakloa, but we call it Japanese forest grass. If you've got shade, and you're trying to find some things to brighten up the shade, this Japanese forest grass looks like waves coming out. That first one that I just did was all gold. I think this one's called Albo striata, which is a variegated form. It kind of rolls out of the shade. For shade, I think everybody needs to have a hosta or two. Now, I've never really been a shade gardener, but this year I've got some shade. I bought 16 or 17 different kinds of hosta, and I'm just so excited about them because they're just now starting to wake up from winter. They look beautiful. And if you've got some shade, hostas are really a good, tough plant. If you've never seen the amount of variation in some of these hosta leaves, we have blues, greens, yellows, variegated miniatures, and there's also great hosta societies out there. I know Middle Tennessee has one. Get on the hosta websites and look at all the variations in those sometimes. We'll see a lot to come out over the next few years also. This is Carex. This is Carex Everillo. And it's a, it's a little yellow. We would think it's a grass, but it's not a grass at all. It's an ornamental Carex. And I've, the next couple of plants are in all kind of like sedges, and that's basically what these are. Kind of makes a little mound. This is Acorus graminaeus minimus aureum. This one is called dwarf golden sweet flag. So we see a lot of sweet flags being used in shadier, moist type areas. This one right here, if you've got a little corner of a building somewhere and you're wanting something to fill in, this only gets four or five inches tall and it makes a thick carpet where nothing else really will grow, if, especially if it kind of stays wet. It can grow in some sun. It prefers to be in the shade though. A little acerum, which is a type of ginger. If you've got some shade, I love the silver foliage on these things. Also, if you've got shade, 
This one won also perennial of the year quite a few years ago. This is Ethereum Pictum, which is just a Japanese painted fern. I wanted to highlight that a couple of times just to show you. Now, there are a lot of variations in some of these Japanese painted ferns, and we're seeing a lot of different cultivars come out of some of these. So some of them will have brighter red stems. Some of them will have more variegation. So look at them, and some of them can get pretty large. But if you've got a shade-type garden, we need to use some of these ferns. And we have a lot of ferns that are native to Tennessee that would also do well. I took this picture just a couple of weeks ago, and I, I love this plant. And I planted it last year, and man, it is blooming its heart out. This is Pulmonaria Diane. Diane Claire, Diana Claire, little blue flowers, silvery foliage. I have it growing under some black walnut trees. So my shade beds are under black walnuts. If you know anything of black walnuts, most things don't grow under black walnuts. Hostas do, and it looks like this little pulmonaria will. Little blue flower. I love this plant. You're going to see more about this plant in the future. If you've not already heard about it right now, this is called Sun King Aurelia. This is a bright yellow shrubby looking type plant for the shade, even though it dies back to the ground completely in the wintertime. We would look at it and think, oh, it's a shrub. It's not. It actually dies back to the ground. But it can get anywhere from three to four feet tall, a big bright spot in the landscape in the shade. It does bloom, but it's really not grown for the blooms. It's grown for that, that yellow foliage, excuse me, for the shade. That is pretty much my presentation. I'm going to hit stop recording up here.